Good morning, dear colleagues. It's a beautiful Monday morning, and I hope your week is getting off to a good start. This is the video I've been promising to talk a little more about the documentary hypothesis that we've been working with. Um, this hypothesis is somewhat complicated, and I appreciate the good faith with which many of you have tried to understand this stuff and work with it. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But it's the theory that there's more than one voice in this material. Um, and that we notice the voices, the different voices, by noticing the differences in the text, the difference in characterization or grammar or word flow or syntax or style or all of those things. Uh, and by, by noticing the differences, we can listen to the different voices and allow them to speak for themselves and speak to us. To ignore those differences is simply to smother those voices and that does great violence to the people who wrote this stuff. It's really not fair. Um, so the documentary hypothesis, the JED and P stuff, that's really more advanced material for more advanced scholars than we need to be. Uh, it's just a kind of a shorthand uh, to say, yeah, I noticed there's a difference. There's a source here and there's a source here, and I notice that there's a difference between the two. Um, and so that probably means that two different people or two different sources produced that. Uh, and then I can, by, by acknowledging that truth, I can separate them out and look at them and talk about them by refusing to notice that difference, uh, I can't. I deprive myself of the, uh, the literary approach here. Um, the documentary hypothesis has its critics. It's a little bit complicated, I understand. And there are some serious scholars who strongly disagree with it. But as Gable says, and I think he's right, uh, it is the theory that provides the largest number of answers and takes into account the largest amount of the evidence that we have in front of us. So it provides some answers, although by no means all of them. So I've talked about Occam's razor before, uh, and that is the theory that one should not multiply instances. Here's my little graphic that I made. There it is. Okay. And how that simplifies our work is, you know, we don't have to identify J, E, D, or P. That's just a kind of a shorthand. It's one way of talking about it, but we don't really have to identify them. We just have to say, there's a source over here that talks like this, writes like this, uses this particular grammar, sentence structure, vocabulary, so forth. And then there's this source over here that uses different vocabulary, different references, different syntax, different sentence structure, different forms, and so forth, and the two are different. Uh, and the first answer that, com that you come to that is logical and takes into account the evidence, uh, and this is a characteristics w char characteristic which this material shares with all other literature, the first answer you come to without multiplying instances, as Occam suggests we shouldn't, is that the material was written by two different sources. There are two different voices there. That's the first answer you come to that makes sense and takes into account the evidence. So if you wish to uh, assert, and you're certainly welcome to do that, but if you wish to assert that, that one person wrote the whole thing, then you have to assert that in the face of the obvious differences, and you have to say, well, one person wrote this whole thing in spite of the fact that... Uh, there are these differences, and then you're skipping over the obvious answer and you're multiplying instances. And <clears throat> according to Occam, the more you multiply instances, the less likely you are to be looking at the truth, and the less likely you will be to take into account the evidence. So, you know, the JED and P stuff, that's a shorthand to talk about. It's not necessary to identify any of those passages as such, but rather we use that as a format to notice the differences, and then talk about why they're there, uh, and make some uh, assumptions about the 
original sources of that material. The best way to think about it is like this. Let's say there's an accident out at the car accident out at the corner of Monterey and Country Club. And I send Mary and Bob out there and I say, Mary and Bob, I want you to go out there and take a look at what has happened and write me up a little report and come back and give me give me a little report uh, on what you observed. So Mary and Bob go out and they look at the accident and they come back and they write up their little reports. And Mary's report is, oh, it was a beautiful Dodge Charger, bright red, and it got all messed up along one side, and it's probably going to cost $5,000 to repair it. And Mary goes on about the car uh, and the damage to the car. Well, that's one voice, so we'll call that M for Mary. And then Bob writes his account, and... Bob says, oh, it tore up all the, the beautiful plants they had planted along the median there. I don't remember, frankly, if there is a median at Country Club in Monterey. But anyway, pretend. Bob says, oh, it tore up all those beautiful plants there, and it's going to take, you know, 10 years for them to grow back, and that intersection won't be as beautiful as it was. And Bob goes on about the plants in the median. So we're going to call that the B source for Bob. And then there's a third voice that's going to be there eventually and the policeman who shows up to investigate the accident and write his official report <clears throat> in which he's going to try to reconstruct the incident most likely with the end in mind of determining who's at fault uh, for both legal and insurance purposes so he's going to write up his report we're going to call that the O source for officer okay now, there's no possibility whatsoever that those reports are going to be identical because those people notice different things. So, what can we notice about the M, the Mary source? Oh, Mary likes cars. Mary's interested in cars. We can say that about Mary. Was it a, was it a Camaro? Or was it a Dodge Charger? They look similar. Maybe Mary was mistaken. We don't know. All we can say is Mary likes cars. Okay, the B source, the Bob source. Bob's interested in gardening and plants and flowers and beauty. Um, okay, that's what Bob's interested in. That's what the B source is interested in. Then the O source, the officer's. Uh, report is going to going to take going to talk about how long it, the skid marks on the street, how long it took for the car to stop, who was probably at fault, uh, was the light red or green at the time that uh, the red charger entered the intersection, and so forth. So the O source is going to be the official source, officer source, and he's going to write about different things. Okay, um, none of those people were there. Those are people who came on the scene after the event. So can we take any of those as absolute eyewitness accounts? No, we cannot, because they were not there. I was also not there. So for me to take the M source, the B source, and the O source, Mary, Bob, and Officer, and say, yes, that's what actually happened, uh, is not possible because they were not there and I was not there. So that's the object in the subject, object dichotomy, the actual event, which cannot be reliably talked about because nobody of the four of us, me, Mary, Bob, and the officer, none of us were there. So there's not a subject in this part of these accounts. I mean, excuse me, uh, there's not an object in these accounts. The subject, Mary, Bob, the officer, and me, I can talk about. Mary likes cars. Bob likes plants. The officer has a job to do to try to establish um, liability. And I'm coming along because I'm interested in reading these accounts and trying to reconstruct some of it. But I, I can only talk about the subjects. I can talk about what Mary noticed. I can talk about what Bob noticed. I can talk about what the officer noticed. And I can be aware of my own biases in what I happen to be noticing. All of those are the subjects. So it's the same thing, the subject-object 
distinction is the same thing. When you're reading the biblical material, you are reading someone's subjective understanding of an event at which they probably were not present. So to take their account and say this is the way it absolutely was is just as difficult for a literary scholar as it is for me to take Mary's account and saying the only thing that was at that corner was that red Camaro. Uh, you know. So the subject object thing is is it's something you do every day, you just don't think about it. But that's how it works. The all of the accounts are subjective, including the officers, because the subject Bob, Mary, the officer, and me have chosen to look at certain things, chosen to report about certain things, and chosen to leave out other things. Those are choices that an author makes. And Occam's razor would lead us to the first logical assumption is that all writers make these kinds of choices, including the writers of this material. So I hope that clarifies it a little bit. I don't want you to get bogged down in this stuff. This is not that important to our purpose. Our purpose is to notice the subjective qualities of each account and then talk about and write about what those particular subjective uh, um, writers were interested in, what they were hoping to accomplish, and so forth and so on. Uh, that's as far as we need to go in this class. So I hope that helps a little bit. Uh, the last thing is, uh, I've been noticing in some of our uh, forum posts that some of you folks are talking uh, a lot about your religious beliefs, your spiritual beliefs, your uh, uh, spiritual, religious, uh, philosophical approaches to the material. Uh, and that's perfectly fine. My classrooms have always been open forums, and I, I think as long as something is presented with respect and courtesy toward people who may have a differing opinion, I don't have any problem with that. I think, in fact, we should say that. So I'm not going to ever say, no, you can't talk about your religious beliefs or your spiritual beliefs or your philosophical beliefs. No, I'm not, not ever going to say that you can't talk about those. But there's a little handful of folks who are doing that to the exclusion of doing the work of the class. Okay, That's going to get you into trouble down the road. You're perfectly welcome to talk about your religious and spiritual beliefs and practices. I think it's interesting. Uh, and I may even chime in with some of mine. But that is not the work of this class. And so we need to be strict with each other, and I will possibly we need to be strict with you and say, look, you need to do the work that the class is requiring you to do. And if you want to talk about your spiritual practices, that's perfectly fine. But if you're talking about your spiritual practices instead of talking about the literature, then you're not doing what the class is asking you to do. And when it comes time to write your paper, uh, you're going to have a lot of trouble. Okay. Um, so I may need to gently remind you, talk about the literary aspects, talk about the lectures, talk about your readings, talk about what you've learned from that. And then in addition to that, if you want to talk about your spiritual practices, I don't have any problem with that. Uh, you can talk about them. I'm not going to take a position. I'm not going to support one or the other. Um, but just be careful that you're also doing the work. Uh, it's especially challenging for some people approaching this material in the way we're approaching it uh, that you want to talk about your particular set of religious answers or non-religious answers. Uh, you want to talk about your particular set of answers and that's the only thing you want to talk about and so you talk about that to the exclusion of talking about what the class is designed to focus us on. Uh, and so when it comes time to write your paper, um, you're, you're going to find you're having difficulty applying those principles because you've never talked about them. So forgive me if I'm a little, um, forgive me if I remind you that you need to also talk about the material of the class, because you do. That's what this class is about. 
Uh, and then the other stuff, it's fine, you know. Uh, be respectful, be courteous to each other, acknowledge that there are people who have differing opinions, talk, discuss, even debate if you want. But do that in addition to the work of the class, not instead of. All right? And if I need to remind you, I'll remind you. It, it's no big deal. Okay? So I'm hoping you're going to have a wonderful week. Uh, we'll start a new unit tomorrow morning. Um, and I'm going to get this video up now, so maybe it'll clarify some things for you. So the documentary stuff, the JED and P stuff, you don't need to worry about that except to just use it as a shorthand to talk about the differences in the texture and style of the material. The subject-object thing, um, I, maybe my uh, little shtick about the car accident helped you understand that difference. You're always reading a subjective account, always. Uh, for a literature, for a, liter a, a scholar of literature's purpose, you're always reading a subjective account. Uh, and then, you know, talk about whatever you want to talk about. It's a free and open forum, but remember that you're talking about what you're supposed to talk about, too, because you'll get into trouble with yourself if you don't. All right, have a great week. I'm going to get this video up for you, and uh, we'll talk soon. Bye bye. Mm-hmm. <laughs>